to remain. Last November, I was attending a research conference at the New York University in Abu Dhabi. A day before that conference, we were invited to attend a public talk by today's guest, Professor David Hook. I was very inspired by that talk. What amazed me the most was the very intriguing questions that Professor Hu received, particularly from the young minds attending his talk. This has also inspired me to start a new initiative at the UP. I'm truly thrilled to host Professor David Hu from Georgia Institute of Technology for today's public talk entitled How to Walk on Water and Climb Up Walls. Insects walk on water. Snakes slither and fish swim. Animals move with astounding grace, speed, and versatility. But how do they do it? And what can we learn from them? From the incredible efficiency of the web dog shape to colonies of ants building rafts out of their own bodies. Professor Wu shows how animals have adapted and evolved to traverse their environments taking advantage of physical laws with results that are startling and ingenious. Professor Hu is a mechanical engineer who studies the interactions of animals with water. Originally from Rockville, Maryland, he earned his BS in mechanical engineering and his PhD in mathematics from MIT. And is now professor of mechanical engineering and biology and adjunct professor of physics at Georgia Tech. He is a recipient of the National Science Foundation Career Award for Young Scientists. He is a recipient also of the Ig Nobel Prize in Physics and the Pineapple Science Prize, which is the Ig Nobel of China. He is the author of the book, How to Walk on Water and Climb Up Walls, published by Princeton University Press. With this new AIDS initiative, of our transformative education drive at AUB, we host particularly Ig Nobel Prize winners to give public talks at AUB. The Ig Nobel Prize is bestowed every year to 10 individuals who, quote, make people laugh and then think, end of quote. The winners receive their awards in Sanders Theater at Harvard University in front of a crowd of around 11,000 people to quote, celebrate the unusual, honor the imaginative, end of quote. This highly intrigues the interest in science, medicine, and technology, particularly among the young minds, as you can see in this hall. Nobel laureates themselves hang over the Nobel Prizes <laughs> to the winners for their remarkable discoveries and inventions. Subsequently, these winners get invited to MIT to deliver research talks about their discoveries. With this new initiative, we hope to be able to host a yearly public talk by an Ig Nobel Prize winner. Library Antoine managed to get 25 copies of Professor Wu's book. They have a stand in the lobby outside SLH. You can get your copy, and Professor Wu will be delighted to autograph it at the end after the lecture. Dr. Wu, the floor is yours. Please welcome Dr. Wu. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kirfani. It's been such a wonderful last two days here. I've never eaten so much in my entire life than I have in Lebanon. <laughs> Food is excellent. So first, I want to start off by thanking um, all the parents for bringing your children here uh, to the show. It's 5, p it's 5 PM. This is probably their nap time, homework doing time. But instead, we're going to talk about all sorts of things that animals do um, and see more than they can see on YouTube, because I think that's where they've learned a lot of things so far. So. Um, I'll start a little bit with, um, this is me. This is, um, that's me when I was the, about the age of some of the kids in the front row. Um, I was about five. My parents uh, were graduate students at, in Chicago and f 
I loved animals ever since I was young. I w loved going to the zoo, loved watching animals on TV. And um, they always convinced me to continue my passions and just continue and watch my curiosities. Um, this is my father. He was a chemist um, in the university. My mother is a chemist as well. And no matter what the applications were, they thought it was important for me to basically look and follow my dreams. So it wasn't until many years later that um, I was mistakenly admitted to MIT um, that I basically learned some of the skills that I needed to, to study how animals move. Um, there I learned there's this topic called engineering and mathematics. And these are things that you can actually use to study um, all the different kind of shapes animals form. This is me, for example, after I got my PhD, I was so happy that I did a flip uh, when I got my PhD robe. My PhD at MIT was on, was on these animals. Does anyone know what these are? Yeah, yeah, they're called water striders. That's right, and you probably, there's lots of bodies of water around here, and what they can do is amazing. They can walk on water, but this is a video of what my kids call uh, two parents having a discussion. You can see they can't just walk, they can wrestle, they can land on their backs on their sides, and they do all this without breaking the water's surface or without getting wet. And the secret is their hairs. So that's their bodies. Each of their legs is a thickness of a human hair. So just like your hair is one of their legs. But it's covered with 10,000 hairs per square millimeter. That makes it the roughest and hairiest surface of all animals. And what that does, it traps air pockets and prevents water from penetrating. So when they actually stand on the water, they're actually standing on a thin layer of air that's trapped between their hairs. And this is me uh, in the experimental lab uh, late at night. Um, this is probably midnight doing our experiments when I was uh, in graduate school. And still with an excellent fashion, fashion sense. <laughs> this is a photograph I took um, when I was a graduate student. Um, we call this photo Icarus. Um, it's, a, it's because there's a large chunk of dye that falls on the water surface. So this is a photo that we put blue dye all over the water, and we shine light from below. Um, if there's no motion, the, the water is blue. But as the insects move, they generate vortices. They push water behind them. And um, you notice they kind of look like rowboats, but there's something missing about the leg. Uh, why wouldn't this not be a very good for rowing? Does anyone know? Yeah. Yes, that's exactly, exactly right. There's no paddle. It's like trying to row through the water using chopsticks. You're not going to get very far. So how in the world can they generate such large vortices? Well, the answer is that they use the forces of surface tension. All water surfaces are coated in a, basically an elastic membrane that resists the deformation and makes it act like a trampoline. When they push down on water, they generate these dimples, these deformations, air pockets. And they use these dimples to push back on more water. So they use their menisci um, as blades and their legs as oars. And they make their paddles instantaneously just by depressing the surface. This um, large spot I mentioned um, is a spot of the dye. And it's surface active. It decreases surface tension. And that causes fluid to flow out. And that allows light to penetrate to the, to the insect. And the insects are attracted to the light. And so it wants to go towards it. But here, the surface tension can be so low, it could actually sink through. So we call these ambitious insects um, uh, Icarus, because if they go too close, they could actually sink through the water surface. And when I first started as a professor at Georgia Tech, um, the textbook that we use in mechanical engineering, this is what all mechanical engineers use to study fluid mechanics, had the photo of my PhD thesis on the cover. So this went extremely well with the students my first semester there. Some of you might ask, um, hey, I want to be like the water starter. I want to walk on water, too. Um, th does anyone know what this animal is? Uh, yeah, in the back, yeah. Lizard. What kind of lizard? Basilisk lizard, yeah. Where is it from? Where? Brazil. They're from Brazil. And they have another name. I can make sure in this talk, they're called Jesus Christ <laughs> lizards. Because they can walk, this is a high speed of it, running across the water surface. And it hits the water surface with such speed that the resistance force, the same force a diver feels when they dive into water, can actually support its weight. 
this is it in real time. It runs that fast in real time. And one of the amazing uh, reasons why it works is because they generate air pockets with their feet so quickly that they can actually pull their feet out before the cavities collapse. Imagine a diver diving into water and basically able to leave the water before the cavity collapses around the diver. Um, that's exactly what happens with its feet. Its feet, actually, the top of its feet don't get wet. Um, it simply strikes the water surface, generates this pothole, and pulls itself out. So it's a combination of hitting it very fast and removing it very quickly allows its feet to stay relatively dry and still able to support its weight. So um, this is a room where a lot of tests happen. That's what the AUB students tell me. And I thought, at the very least, at the end of this lecture, you should know how to walk on water in case somebody asks you. So we've learned two ways. You could be really lightweight like that wa insect, the water strider. Um, but then you'd have to have, uh, to support yourself with surface tension, you'd have to have feet about 10 kilometers um, in rate in circumference. Um, so that's too big even probably to put out um, near the ocean. It's just too big. And the reason is because we weigh 100,000 times more than these insects. These insects weigh just like the weight of a paper clip. They just can't support, we just can't support our weight with this method. Uh, the other method is by slapping the surface very quickly, like the lizard. And the good news is you can run on water just as quickly as um, this lizard. You can move your feet 15 meters per second. Um, but the problem is, is that you can't move through water. Water is a thousand times dense than air. So if you want to push your feet that quickly through water, you could, you'd have to have exoskeleton that increases the power you generate. Um, and even then, you'd still have feet the size of garbage can lids, about a square meter. Um, yeah. Who? Usain Bolt. Oh, Usain Bolt. Even Usain Bolt would have the problem. Because he, he probably only runs about twice as fast as you do. He's, he doesn't have enough power to push the water. Usain Bolt is the fastest man on Earth, but he's not the fastest man through water. He just can't push the water. It's too dense. So based on the things that um, we learned, I learned in my PhD, I built this device. It's called Robo Strider. It's um, the size of my hand. Um, it's a lightweight robot that um, weighs about a third of a gram, and it supports itself with surface tension. So we call it a dry rowboat. Basically, as it rows its legs across the water surface, it doesn't actually penetrate the surface like a rowboat does. It just deforms like a saran wrap or like a skin of a pudding. It deforms the surface, and that allows it to push itself forward. Uh, this has been 10 years since it's built, and since then there have been over 30 versions built on uh, very, to be out of lightweight materials, solar powered, to be used to scan the oceans and look for chemical spills. So this was my PhD thesis, and since then I want to show you some of the work I've been doing in my lab. Um, and I've gotten not just from insects, but to also larger animals. Raise your hand if you have a cat. There's a good number of cat owners here. There must be at least 100 cats on campus. They're all different colors and shapes. Um, and they're all hungry. And um, if you look at cats, you notice a couple of things. One, they sleep a lot. Cats sleep about, um, I think, about 14 hours a day. Um, a lion sleeps 22 hours a day. Oh, 22 hours, yeah. It's a king of the jungle. King of the jungle can do a lot of sleeping. And the remaining time, they spend one third of their hours grooming. So that's about two hours. And I'm looking around this room. I'm trying to decide if any of you spent two hours grooming today. There's a few people that may look like they spent two hours grooming. But most of us spent less than one hour, I would say, far less. Um, and these are cats grooming. They're cats all day from your house cat to your tiger to your lion to your cheetah. This guy's being licked by a cheetah on his head. It's very painful. And this grooming helps to remove oils and blood. They, these animals have basically, after they've eaten their meal, they're covered in this blood, and they've got to keep themselves clean in order to catch the next, next meal. But have any of you thought about how a cat actually grooms? What happens? These are high-speed videos. So as a scientist, I have the best cameras in my lab. We can basically see what happens over a single second of a cat's groom. Every time a cat moves its tongue through his fur, you see this. Has anyone been licked by a cat? Does it feel good? Yes. Some, one person said yes. But, 
But um, in general, most people feel like it's like sandpaper. Um, it feels much rougher than if you're licked by a person. <laughs> that feels a lot better, I think. Um, and the sandpaper feeling is because the cat has 290 spikes called papillae, um, small um, curved spikes on his tongue that as the tongue expands during the groom, they make contact with the fur and deposit saliva. The great thing about studying cats is that there's lots of them. So in biology, there's this technique you can compare. It's called the um, comparative technique. You can compare different animals and basically make conclusions based on what all the animals do. That's your house cat tongue, a bobcat. House cat, this is an American quarter. The house cat's about, tongue's about as big as my thumb. Um, a snow leopard, a tiger, and a lion. That tongue is as big as your head. <laughs> Heard someone screaming. And, but like all these animals, they all have the same number of spikes. They have about 290 little papillae, and each of them look like this. So in our school, and most elementary schools, they have this technology called 3D printers and 3D scanners. We can actually take one of these spikes and 3D scan it, and this is exactly what it looks like. And as engineers, we try to figure out its function. Like if you found this on another planet, what would you think it does, and how does it work? And when I first saw this, I saw it has a narrow groove on the top. And that immediately made me think of what's called capillary action. Basically, if you have a very thin stir um, and you touch it with to water, water automatically gets sucked up into the pipe. And this is because water wants to reduce its surface area um, and minimize its surface area so it basically wants to contact this hydrophilic surface as much as possible. So these cat spikes, they act like a lock and key for saliva. Every time the cat mm, closes its mouth, the spikes automatically absorb all the saliva like a sponge. And then these, you can see, is very closely t uh, stuck inside the spike. If I take the cat and whirl it around, that saliva is still going to stay in the spike. It's not going to come out. The only thing that can make it come out is the cat's own fur. So this is the cat's own fur being rubbed through the spike. And you can see it's exactly the right width to pull the saliva coating out of it. The saliva acts like a detergent. It dissolves all the blood and oil. Um, and as you can see, this is a thermal video. This is where we um, look at the heat the cat generates. The tongue is, um, sorry, the nose is blue and cold. That's what wakes you up in the morning because it's so wet. The cat fur, the inside's hot. That's why it turns bright. And it only brightens up as the animal parts its fur, allowing heat to escape. The cats have gone so reliant on these uh, method of depositing saliva that they leave um, these wet spots and that eventually cools them. This is actually how cats stay cool. Uh, unlike us, they don't have any sweat glands. The cats only rely on their saliva to keep themselves cool. And there's about uh, two tablespoons a day of saliva. Uh, that's about, I think, five milliliters they would leave all over their body. Uh, so every time you touch your cat and it's rubbing itself, think five milliliters of saliva. That's about how much they leave every day. So I'm an engineer. Um, we study animals, but we also try to build things based on them. And um, I'm also a father. And one of the things I noticed, my daughter had lice. And uh, I was at the uh, CVS pharmacy at 3 a.m. looking for different combs for her lice. And I noticed combs haven't changed their design in over 10,000 years. This is not too far from here. This is a Syrian comb, 8,000 BC. All combs are vertical, rigid spikes. Compare that to the cat tongue. The cat tongue composed of basically spikes that are facing forward, and they're embedded in a soft substrate, allowing them to bend. And when we film, when we use these combs through hairs, we notice that they can basically change their angle depending on how much um, force they feel. So they're sensitive to the forces, and they can become, uh, change their profile. The other thing we notice is that um, they have interesting self-cleaning properties. Um, I see a lot of people have lush coat, heads of hair here. Maybe on a Friday night, you've spent time doing this, pulling the hair out of your comb with a bucket of ice cream, maybe a nice romantic movie, trying to clean your comb. And you do, if you do so, you'll notice it takes a long time because each of these spikes is rigid, and the hairs have to be removed piece by piece. And if the cat had to do that, imagine a lion doing that with its own tongue. It would be a disaster. The lion would be even more unhappy. So instead, for, because the uh, lions, um, this is a, a t the basically special comb we made from the spikes, um, they're all facing one direction. So 
as the lion rubs against the roof of its mouth, there are small bumps called rugulae, the hairs in his tongue all get wrapped up in a single hairball that can be conveniently ejected any time of the day into your slippers, 2 a.m., 3 a.m., any time at once, it can pull out the hairball and make your life miserable. Raise your hand if you have a dog. So we'll talk about dogs for a little bit. Dogs are amazing. Um, we weighed a dog when it was wet, and it had a 40-pound dog, um, uh, we should do this kilograms, about a 20-kilogram 20, 20 dog has about um, half a kilogram of water in its fur. Um, you have about the same amount all over your body when you came out of a shower. And if you weigh yourself on the, it's all in about a layer of about a millimeter thick all over your skin. But the amazing thing about dogs is they can dry themselves. They can remove that half kilogram of water in just about half a second. And uh, sometimes I try to emulate the dog. I go into my office and I get on all fours um, and I close the door and I try to like shake my head and shake my shoulders and, and my back. Maybe some of you can try it at home, but it's very, very difficult to do it as good as this dog. Because the dog even has this special technique. It gets all the water out, and then even the tail has this special technique to get that tail, tail dry. Um, very, very coordinated. So we went to the zoo to study these animals, and we found that it's not just dogs that do this. Anytime you evolved fur, you had to evolve a way to keep it dry. They call this the wet dog shape, but did you know that mice do the same thing? <clears throat> that dog shake was about four times per second. So every single uh, blink of an eye, there was about one shake for the dog. This mouse shakes 30 times per second, 10 times as fast as the dog. So that means in the blink of an eye, you'll see about 10 of these shakes. Um, it happens far faster than you can see, uh, but it's just as effective. Here's a rat um, uh, doing the same shake, but you notice it does a special technique. It closes its eyes. And um, the reason for this is because the, this generates, shake generates a huge amount of force. Um, the person to discover this was named Colonel John Stapp. He was an Air Force uh, pilot, and he put himself on rocket sleds. And his job was to figure out how much force can the body take before you die. And so he would put himself on a rocket sled and put on a high speed and slam on the brakes at the last minute. And he found that you were pretty good up until 15 times Earth's gravity. After that, your eyeballs start popping, popping out of your face. And so the rat has to close his eyes to prevent its eyeballs from popping out. Um, so they're really, they don't want those eyeballs popping out. That's a bad, bad thing. And here's a bear. It's um, shaking with the same, uh, uh, here's only two, uh, four times per second, uh, even sl about as slow as the dog. And it's shaking with such force, it can't even keep his eyes shut. Its eyelids are so heavy that it just opens them up. It still says it wants to look at you. So the reason why we can't do it as well as a dog is partly because they have very special skin. If you take the back of a dog and move it, the dog has a layer of very slippery skin under its fur. Um, it's very low friction. Scientists are still trying to understand that. But this is a, for example, this is a um, straw that's taped to the back of the animal. So we tape it right to the back. And it shows the back of the animal goes 90 degrees to the left, 90 degrees to the right, basically 3 o'clock to 9 o'clock. It is very, very good at moving. I cannot move my skin that much. I mean, I've tried. And this is amazing because if you actually look at the skeleton of the animal, this is the skeleton of a rat um, shaking. Um, actually, I want to come up with a good dance move for this one. Uh, this looks like it could be on MTV. Um, but if you look at the backbone, it's quite rigid. Only goes back and forth 11 o'clock to 1 o'clock. It's very good at doing this. So it's a combination of the, basically the motion and the loose skin. If you shake with loose skin, you can get, imagine you get three times the amplitude. That means you get three times the speed. And you get nine times the force. So animals with loose skin get almost 10 times as much force just by um, shaking and having loose skin. There's a lot of animals that you see as quite ordinary, like ants, but they can actually do some amazing things. Um, these, does anyone know what kind of ants these are? Yeah. Uh, them, uh, I, I, I don't quite remember, but fire, fire ants. Fire ants? Fire ants? Red ants. Red fire ants, yeah. 
They're called fire ants because it hurts. Feels like fire. You have them here? OK, because I brought some in my bag. <laughs> oh, no, no. They're, <laughs> they're actually all over the world. The people are trying to get rid of them. Um, and they, they're, one of the amazing things they can do, they can build these rafts. So the fire ants, they evolved for millions of years in a place that is flooded entirely with water over the summer. And to survive, the fire ants actually have to link themselves together and stay afloat. Um, the way they link is, is, is basically with very small drops of glue. This is actually the tip of your ant's foot. Every time it walks on the walls or on the ceiling, it leaves small drops of glue. Um, it's a combination of a hydrophobic and hydrophilic fluid. It allows it to stick to almost anything, plants, glass. And it even allows the ants to stick to each other. We flash froze one of those ant rafts and looked at all the connections. These are all the spots one ant can touch another ant. They're very good at sticking even to hairy surfaces. So you might ask, how do you study fire ants? Well, in Atlanta, Georgia, what we do is we drive along a highway with a bucket and a shovel. And we dig every time we see a big ant mound. And we bring the ants and the soil all back home. But now you have this problem. The ants and the soil are mixed together. How do you separate them? What we do is a technique called dripping, where overnight we drip water drop by drop into the bucket. And we come back the next day. And this is what we get. The soil is bottom. The ants have followed each other one by one, evacuating their tunnels and building basically this kind of a, yeah, kind of like a brown salad that floats on water. So what the ants are doing, they're building something that's very similar to the water strider's leg. It's the first example in nature of animals cooperating to build this hydrophobic surface. So this is actually the water surface. That is an air pocket inside. Every time you try to sink the ants, the air basically pushes out and prevents water from penetrating. It's the same forces of surface tension that prevent this um, from happening. Amazing thing is one ant's denser than water. So if you put any soap in the water, this whole thing sinks. It's got to trap these air pockets in order for it to float. And you can see it's also very flexible. And that's also what makes it super, super good at floating. Um, and a lot of people have Googled this video to try to look at how to kill ants. Um, so I'm happy that the, I've supplied them with some entertainment. So this uh, also shows you what happens when the raft bounces into a rock. It's 80% air and only 20% solid. So that means every time it hits a rock, it can actually store energy like a spring and bounce back. None of these ants are getting injured. You can try this at home. Just wear gloves. Um, this is actually a film of a penny falling through that raft of ants. Gravity is going down. And this is real time. What happens, the ants are acting like a yogurt, um, where in front of the, ra the penny, they're, they're breaking their bonds. And behind the penny, they're reconnecting their bonds and making this act like a solid material um, that's fluidizing, becoming a liquid just in, in front of the penny. That's another way they can survive basically hitting these different surfaces. Here's a good video for your nightmares. This is what happens if you take an ant raft and pull it, pull it apart. Um, it looks like cheese. Or I guess here, like hummus. Mmm, <laughs> hummus. <laughs> yeah. So uh, when you would do a tug of war, you also basically, uh, basically people, this is basically a tug of war between thousands of ants and they, they change their, they basically ink, hold on with greater strength when there are fewer numbers. That's why there's fewer ones of these. Um, so if they wanted to, they could break each other apart. During war, they can actually literally pull apart other ants. But they're smart enough when they're holding each other to just um, uh, break their connections if the forces are too high. So to study this, um, you saw the ant raft was very strangely shaped. Um, we make what we call in Atlanta, we don't get real snow, but we make this thing called ant snowballs. Um, and we can throw them at each other. Um, but it's quite dangerous, actually, because if you have a beard, they just get all over your beard. And they'll bite you like three days later. You just won't even notice. And we can put this ball on the water surface. And we watch how the different shapes, how it forms basically always two layers. 
even though there's 10,000 ants inside this mound, they'll always form two layers. And we've done experiments to show they have little sensors in them that measure the forces on top. And basically, this is how they know that their job is done. If they didn't have this sensor, the ant raft would continue to separate into all these little pieces, and you would never get one full raft. So you've got to have a switch to go from basically a fluid to a solid, like to go from your salad to a, uh, sort of to a yogurt. The raft isn't always circular, too. Here it can actually reach out towards land, like a sort of a, an amoeba. Um, and here's little boats that can do the same thing. They have, um, this is made by UPenn. They have small hooks, and they have propellers that control their direction. And when they have 50 of them in a row, um, a truck can actually climb across, act like a bridge. So you've been a great audience. The last thing I want to talk about uh, today, um, and I warned the people in the front that we are going to talk about P today. Um, that's OK, right? This is like PG-13 audience. This is a college, college class, so we can talk about, we can talk about these things. Because I'm sure you've been wondering how this works. So I did this project um, when I was an assistant professor. And um, uh, my wife and I, we basically just had kids. And I was completely miserable because I was changing diapers like every two hours for hours and for like basically several years of my life. Um, and um, has anyone changed a diaper before? <laughs> I heard the kids all saying no, but you will change them someday. <laughs> you will make up for your. Um, make up for all the suffering you've caused. But when you change diapers, usually it's fine, but sometimes kids play games. And one of the games they play is, hey, let's try to pee when the diaper's off. <laughs> and, uh, and there was the, the one time that my son did that to me. And um, it was the middle of the night. I was so tired. I just sat there watching the pee come out. <laughs> and, uh, and I noticed, while well, I was getting angry, and I noticed that it was taking a long time. And I'm generally considering myself pretty patient. And I started counting my son's pee, like 15, 16, 17 <laughs> seconds. And I found I counted all the way up to 21 seconds. And I, that was the first time I counted any kid's pee. And that was much longer than I thought it should be. Um, it made me so worried that I thought I would have to go to the doctor and wait in the waiting room and bring my kid. Maybe he had some blockage in his bladder. Um, so I decided instead to put his diaper on and go to the bathroom and do my own experiments. So um, I pulled down my pants and sat in the toilet. And I started counting my own pee time. And I counted all the way up to 22 seconds. And I thought, my son urinates like a real man already. He's only like one year old, but he can already urinate like me. But it, the more that I thought about it, the less sense it made. Because look, kids are, that kid is 10 times smaller than me. He's got 10 times less blood, 10 times less urine. How can it come out in the same amount of time? And I have a PhD in fluid mechanics. I can't under, couldn't understand this question. So it really bothered me. I thought about it all day. And then I went to my um, undergraduate fluid mechanics class and told them this story in the lecture. And they were just, shocked and just like disgusted. And I, I said, but if anyone wants to get extra credit, they can come help me for a special project at the Atlanta Zoo. Because I want two of you to come down and take a bucket and a stopwatch to the zoo and measure the urination time and volume of every animal at the zoo. And that should answer this question. How long does my son pee? How long does, do I pee? And how long do animals pee? Um, and. Um, most people said no, but I found three pre-medical students. <laughs> and I will, find, I will tell you, pre-medical students will do anything, anything, absolutely anything um, to learn. So this, uh, the middle student wearing the boxer shorts, he loved this project so much that he actually became a professional urologist. For you kids, that was a professional pee, -pee doctor. He, do, he never stopped. He still looks at pee all the time. He's going to give me a free exam next year. I asked him to give me a free exam. So they go to the zoo, and they, they come back after two weeks. And they come back very, very depressed um, and dusty. And they say the rhino urine is the smelliest in the world. And they said our data is not very interesting. It really 
doesn't look like it's anything, any trends. I said, just tell me one thing. Tell me what the elephant did. And they showed me these videos. So for the first time, and maybe the last time at AUB, the first Ig Nobel Prize lecture, we have the evolution of the urinary system. <laughs> have you ever seen a rat urinate? This is what it looks like. They generate so little pressure. So the, the, the force of surface tension, the same one that supports the water strutter, pushes back the urine in the body. So when the rat's actually too small, the female rat actually has to lick, uh, the mother has to lick the urethra to keep the urine out, keep the urine coming out. I hear some ooze. This is probably similar to what you saw this morning or right before the talk. Um, a goat urinating, this is, probably, this is what's called a Rayleigh plateau instability. We study how that turns into drops. <laughs> this is what happens when you shoot fluid out of a sheath. Um, you get what's called fluid fish bones, a sort of planar structure. And this is my favorite video of all, my t of all time, because it's my PhD student's first work and second paper, all in the same video. I was super pleased with this video, because I said, we can write two papers on this. Um, in fact, there's a journal. Um, uh, let's pause it. There's a journal called Soft Matter. And we published a paper, a cover issue called Hydrodynamics of Defecation um, with this video. Um, but that's, uh, you have to grow older if you want to, if you want to. Um... We could just sit here for the rest of the talk and watch this over and over. <laughs> One last time. All right, okay, that's enough, that's enough. So they showed me these videos, and after I watched this video about 10 times, um, after I watched this video about 10 times, I asked them, well, tell me the story of the elephant. Tell me what happened. Well, he said, to study elephants, it's the hardest because elephants don't listen to anything you say. So what they have to go is go in into the zoo when the elephant wakes up. And they take a kitchen garbage can, you know, the big kind, um, 20 liters, this, tall, this wide and this tall. And they put it under the elephant and wait. And then the urine comes. And they find that it's enough to fill the entire garbage can. That 20 liters of urine is 100 times a dog's bladder. And I asked them, how long does it take to get 100 times more fluid out? And they said it took about 22 seconds. I said, this is the biggest discovery of my career. <laughs> so we call this the law of urination. How can you get 100 times more fluid out in the same amount of time? Well, here's an example. We do this experiment, a rhino bladder, a human bladder, and a dog bladder. And underneath here is the pipes of the appropriate width and length. And you see, if you have these pipes, the fluid can empty out at the same time, even though they're vastly different volumes. And this is how it works. I'll take the elephant urethra as an example. The elephant, so my son and my daughter are always fighting because my son's always saying, I have a pee pee pipe, you don't have a pee pee pipe. And I say, stop, both of you have PB pipes. <laughs> Female PB pipes, or this, this is basically the long tube, are just inside the body, but they're almost the same aspect ratio. For males, it's like 18 to 1. For females, it's 14 to 1. That means that a female elephant has a PB pipe that's about a meter long and about the width of my fist. And for years, no one knew why doctors and veterinarians, why animals have these pipes in their body. But it turns out the elephant pipe if it's this wide, imagine it's like a highway. Multiple cars can go through the pipe and exit. So the wider it is, the more urine can flow. But the taller it is, the more gravity can increase the speed. Um, if you ever have a beer keg, this is probably not a good example for the young kids, but if you take a beer keg and you chop a hole in the bottom and the middle and the top, the beer comes out much faster from the bottom. And it's because the weight of the fluid inside is pushing the beer out. And that's exactly what animals are doing with the, your, their urethras or their pee pee pipes. Um, the weight of this fluid is acting on the pipe, um, and that's allowing a huge amount of fluid to come out in the same amount of time. As a result, an elephant urinates like five shower heads. So if you stood underneath the elephant, it'd be like taking five showers, except you wouldn't get very clean. So as Dr. Kirfani said, um, when, we, when we wrote this paper, um, I won what was called the Ig Nobel Prize. And I wore a toilet seat to the ceremony. Um, this is me. And the Ig Nobel Prize, 
um, the award is given out by six Nobel laureates um, who donate their time to the ceremony. And the Nobel Prize winners have an important task. There's about a thousand paper airplanes thrown at the winners. And the Nobel Prize winners are there to be the janitors. So they sweep up all the paper airplanes at the end of the show. Um, so thanks for being such a great audience. Um, I'm Dr. David Hu on Twitter. Um, I was just, I'm in Beirut this week, Norway, China, Alabama, San Diego, and Pittsburgh over the next few months. Um, the book's been translated into Chinese, uh, Japanese, and Korean, and it's on Audible. And um, we'll do, if you're interested, um, we'll do a book signing outside. outside. Thank you very much. Questions, one microphone here, one microphone here. Where are the... So we'll start with the kids. If any kids have any questions, yeah, please go ahead. Um, when, when, like the cat's nails, mm -hmm. um, like it's on the tongue, mm -hmm. how, how can they taste with the nails instead of taste buds? Like, how can they taste? They, um... They have 290 of those spikes, and the taste buds are sort of adjacent, adjacent to it. But you're right. It's, um, it's a big nuisance to have your tongue covered in nails. Like if you're eating food, basically everything has to pass through those, those things. Um, um, th there's enough room for the taste buds, but I think they have to do some special, special techniques. Um, there's probably some residue from like lunch and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. How can cats actually come on? Well, oh, cats. How can they climb up your curtains? They have these retractable nails that are actually the same shape as the ones on their tongue. These engineers have shown that if you have this curved shape, it's best to avoid from breaking. Um, so they use the same structures on their feet as on their, as on, on their tongue. Um, but it needs to be a very rough surface. Can you yeah. pass the microphone? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. That Air Force Colonel who on yeah, Colonel John Stapp. Is he okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he just had difficulty with vision for the rest of his life. Um, uh, and I think his family was not super happy. <laughs> yeah, but he was the first person to figure out um, that amount of acceleration. I mean, you get into a really bad car crash, you get about half that much. So um, only sort of Air Force pilots would experience 15 times Earth's gravity. Okay, go ahead. How, how, do, um, oh, okay. how do ants stick together if they don't like, stay together like glue on paper and stick together? They, they have retract, those retractable, um, they have little balloons that eject the smallest amount of glue and they can sort of pull those things off. It's still really unknown. I mean, it's a really thin layer, that amount of glue. It's like a tenth the width, witness, width of your human hair. Um, but you're right, that's one of the amazing things. They can basically stick really strongly. You saw that ant support 100 body weights. And also unstick when you saw the nightmare video of the ants pulling apart. So, um, and we still don't have materials that can basically provide what's called temporary adhesives, just like the ants. OK, the girl all the way in the back. How do the cats remove the fur from their tongue? They have, if you feel the roof of your mouth, you have these bumps. They're called rugulae. And uh, what the cats do is rub the tongue up along that curve. And because the spines are all pointed one direction, fur automatically comes off in a roll. Um, so it's part of the design of the cat's tongue spikes to be all facing one direction. Otherwise, they would have hairy tongue. Um, and that doesn't sound very pleasant. Okay, go ahead. The air pockets are the speed. Which one does it let it run on water? Um, people have, the um, air pockets are important for really small insects. Like if you see ants walking on a pool, you just take a little drop of soap, all the ants will sink. Um, but they've shown recently that geckos, if you're, the lizard was about as big as your hand, about 10 grams. But geckos, the ones that crawl on the ceiling, those can run on water, and they do a combination of the insect and the lizard. So they use the surface tension. They have a small pocket of air, and they use the slapping method. So depending on how big you are, you might use a little bit of both. Can you pass the microphone? You have another question? Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, um, so about the ants that have the glue, um, 
They have a small pump, and uh, they're always in tr problem of desiccation. So ants, uh, they need to drink water every two or three hours because they have such a large surface area that water will just evaporate. And every time they walk, they have to leave little ant footprints, like a slug. Um, so they basically have a pump that mixes a very small amount of chemical to make the water into slime. Yeah. Well, you're going to write the PhD pieces. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Third question. Go. Um, It's mostly water. Um, it's enough to hold 100 ant weights. Um, so um, it's more than they need. Um, but sometimes in emergencies, they, need, they need to have that kind of force. Can you pass it to Nihal? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Nihal. Um, uh, have you ever like, measured um, buffalo urine? Oh, buffalo urine. I think it's like two, two minutes and a half or something. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of, since I published this paper, I've received many emails from all over the world um, of people showing me their urination videos um, of their pets. And um, I didn't mention this, but um, as animals get older and humans get older, uh, you notice that you no longer follow the law of urination. In fact, there's maybe some members of this audience, if they're male and older, you'll notice that you can urinate for up to, I mean, there's people that urinate for up to like two minutes on average. Um, and uh, the reason is, is because the, the prostrate expands, it's a sort of a, and it, it shrinks the pee pee pipe. Um, and in fact, this uh, work, this uh, doctor used this work to help diagnose different kinds of um, urinary disorders by seeing how long um, it takes to pee. Somebody who did not ask a question yet. You didn't ask yet. Yeah. I did. You did? Okay. Some new members, people who did not ask before, yeah, the two kids right here. Oh. Can you pass the microphone right here? We're still uh, going to take a group picture. All the kids with Professor Who, don't leave. No. You, you are asking him, not me. Okay. Yeah, but... Put the microphone closer. Go. Uh-huh. Yeah. On top, right. So, so how can I put it back? Oh, what happens if you put a thousand people on top of you? Um, <laughs> well, there's two things. The ants are 80% air, so that top surface is not, is, um, is not that heavy. But the other thing is that when you get small, ants can, small things can support a huge amount of weight because just the, how material properties become more effective. For example, to crush an ant, you need to apply 10,000 times its body weight to actually kill an ant. Uh, you put pen, a stack of pennies this tall. Uh, 10,000 times your body weight is a house. Um, uh, so because when you get very small, your materials get effectively stronger. And that's how the ants can do such amazing things. So if you ever want robots to do something like the ants, they're going to have to be small. OK, a couple more questions. Do you have a question as well? Your brother? Did you have a brother? Can insects drop in water? Sorry? Can insects Say that again. Can all insects? Oh, can all insects. Um, to some extent, um, they can sort of stay on the water surface, but only the water striders. There's about a thousand species of the insects that evolved the very, very hairy surfaces. Only when you have very hairy surfaces can you be uh, not sticky to water, and sort of they can sort of pick their legs up with ease. The other insects sort of get stuck, um, so they can sort of survive, but not so well. In fact, they become food for all the water striders. The water striders eat the animals that can't walk on water. The insects that stuck, get stuck there. Go ahead. Can, uh, can a lizard carry another lizard Oh, like a piggyback? Can you do piggyback on the water surface? Um, the, um, I think they, they might, I think it would be hard for them to balance. Um, there's actually birds called Clark's Grebes that they mate um, to convince the other bird that they're strong enough. They have to run 100 meters on the water surface, just like the lizard. Um, so they have to practice really hard to be able to do that. Um, uh, the water striders, they actually, um, when they mate, they have two of them, one on top of each other. So they have to at least support twice their weight. Usually they can support 100 times their weight. Um, but the biggest water strider in the world is about this big. It lives in Vietnam, and it can only support two. More than that, three, it's going to sink. 
So some of them really push the envelope on how much they can support. We can entertain some questions from grown-ups as well. If any grown-ups have questions, yeah. Yeah. let's go to grown-ups right now. Uh, right in the back, please. I want to have observed recently in the animal behavior which has intrigued you and you haven't found a mechanical explanation yet. Um, uh, one animal that we're studying um, recently is um, the elephant's trunk and how they can pick up, pick up objects. Um, elephant's trunk, they can extend to almost 50% their length. Um, and uh, they do so by having, they use the same muscle as we have in our tongues, the hydrostatic, hydrostatic muscle. But it's how can it basically extend that much without shrinking so much in diameter is still kind of like an open question. So we're studying how they can actually pick up potato chips without breaking potato chips. Um, and they can act very, very gentle with, ju with being 100 kilograms. And so we're working with some roboticists on how to figure out how elephants can sense their surroundings. Um, one day, people want to build robots that can kind of comb your hair and brush your teeth. And they're going to have to be as gentle as the elephants, but also be strong enough to pick up things. Two more questions from grown-ups before we wrap yeah. this up. And you're going to have the last question. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Well, it's a new question. It's a new question. Is yeah. it feasible to have a copy of your book offered to a library? It is already there. It is signed by him, and it is in the library, science library. Yeah, I dedicate it to AUB, the AU, AUB. Yeah, it's to the AUBites and the cats. And you already dedicated it. Okay, here you go. You can stick around and ask questions when we are done. And uh, Kelly Farris will be taking interviews on your way up for a special video that will be posted on YouTube. Go ahead. Uh, so basically, I want to become a zoologist, but, mm. my, but my mom says, like, what is the purpose of animals? Like, why, what is their role in life? And like, I can't seem to find a proper way to answer her question. Is she here? No. <laughs> well, she can watch this video. So like, what, what, do I, what do I tell? How can I tell? Well, all the hardest problems in engineering and science we really have no way to answer them. And looking at animals is a really good way to get inspiration to study very, very difficult things. And then come up with creative solutions that no one would have thought of otherwise. Um, I mean, when I was a student, I was actually a pre-medical, just like um, uh, the student who was filming the, the urination. Um, and uh, I just got really turned on to science. So there's room in this world for, for basically basic research and applied research. Well, yeah, one, yeah. one last, now one last for. Okay. Yeah. Uh, recently, we, we found a lot of uh, tests and experiments done uh, for the sake of environment and for the environment. Uh, for instance, uh, the spiders, mm -hmm. they, the spider webs, they're making from them uh, uh, jackets against bullets, etc. Yeah. And also the owls, when they are attacking the rats, they don't have any, any sound. Yeah, owls are silent. So yeah. Making, uh, Maybe uh, civil aviation, which is noise, uh, noise yeah. or uh, avoiding noise pollution. So, uh, regarding your uh, experiments on such animals and insects, are you, are you planning to do something similar for the environment or to, to invent something from such an experiment that are for the environment? The cat tongue brush I showed you, um, we were doing a patent on it, and uh, L'Oreal is interested in that patent because they're interested in brushes that help conserve water. Um, Cats can keep themselves clean with only three tablespoons of saliva per day. Um, we use, um, you know, 10 liters per shower. So we can learn our ways, basically, to comb hair using a brush that's inspired by the cat. Um, it could be a really big savings of water and good for the environment. So there are some copies still outside if you want to have it signed by Professor Ho. Yeah. Let's thank her for a beautiful talk. Thank you. And, uh, I want to ask my team to join me here uh, for a group picture, and then all the kids will take a group picture. We're going to give a small token of appreciation to Professor Wu, which is just a copy of this poster. Oh, thanks. <laughs>